can we supervise a superhuman AI model using only a human supervisor? The short answer is no, we don't know how to do this today, which is why in this paper they study an analogy. Can small models like GPT-2 supervise bigger models like GPT-4? Turns out the answer is yes, as they show in this graph, where you see the performance on some NLP benchmark of four different things. We have a weak supervisor, naive fine-tuning, our method, and strong sailing. And the performance is measured by the performance of different models on the same task, from GPT-2 to GPT-4. But what do we mean exactly by a weak supervisor or even naive fine-tuning? The way to get a weak supervisor is by taking a small pre-trained model, let's say GPT-2 in our case, and you fine-tune it on some ground truth labels. So you have your NLP datasets like hella swag, glue, super glue, or some ethics datasets, and you fine-tune your GPT-2 on those labels. And in this case, you get some fine-tuned model that we call the weak supervisor. And this weak supervisor will be able to predict on a held out set of examples. And on these examples, you will get the labels generated by this supervisor, which we call weak labels. Given these weak labels, we train a strong student model with weak supervision. And we call this guy the strong student model. This all seems very vague. But if we look at the code that they open sourced, we can see that it's just training a weak model on the first half of the training data. Then you train the strong model on the second half of the training data with labels generated by the weak model. Then you train a strong model on the second half to give us some baseline on what we could achieve. If we had GPT-4 without any supervision from GPT-2, but just like directly fine tune on some NLP dataset, what would we get as a performance? But what is our method here? Our method is simply to encourage the strong model to be more confident, including confidence in disagreeing with the weak supervisor if necessary. They do this by having some auxiliary confidence loss that forces the model to be more confident. But does this approach work on other tasks other than the NLP datasets we've been talking about? The answer to these questions is yes and no, as we can see in these three graphs. On the left, we have the NLP task that we've been discussing so far. In the middle, we have the chess puzzles, and at the end, we have the ChatGPT we were modeling. But what do we mean by chess puzzle here? In the pre-training dataset, they already had some chess games, but now, in the fine-tuning dataset, they have board puzzles, where you have a position and you need to find the best move. Queen takes rook, bishop takes rook, and then checkmate. So the best move is only the first move to, to play here. But since we cannot like pass images, at least not in the setup, they pass as prompts the entire moves sequences that led to this exact board position. And the label is just the best move to do. But it turns out the naive fine tuning doesn't work really well when the gap between student and supervision is too large. That's why they solve this problem using bootstrapping, a long-standing idea in alignment, where instead of directly aligning very superhuman models, we first align an only slightly superhuman model and use that to align an even smaller model. In practice, it means they have a sequence of model sizes M1 to Mn, of increasing sizes, and you use the weak label from M1 to fine tune M2, etc. Which leads us to this graph, where you see the results of the bootstrapping on the chess performance. So the line here corresponds to one trajectory of bootstrapping. Here we have three steps. We start with one model, we increase with bootstrapping, another one, another one. After each iteration, the student has more and more compute. Whereas the dotted lines correspond to what we had before, where there's no bootstrapping and it's just weak to strong performance directly. And we can see that uh, using the bootstrapping, we managed to get higher test accuracy on the chess problems. But if we go back to the main results, we're still far from recovering the full performance. The other task where the performance is not fully recovered is the ChatGPT reward modeling. But what is reward modeling, you might ask? Let's say you have a dataset consisting of dialogue between a human and an assistant, for instance, ChatGPT. Our reward model is trained to predict the results of pairwise comparisons between completions. So in the case of humans comparing multiple possible responses from the assistant when we're doing error like Jeff, we get some human preference data. And training a reward model is training a reward model to be able to predict what would be the results of pairwise comparisons between new completions. As you can see in the graph, the performance gap between the naive fine-tuning and the ceiling is quite high for ChatGPT reward modeling. To solve this, they use unsupervised generative fine-tuning for reward modeling. So what do they mean by generative fine-tuning here? It's just a way to increase the salience of a task without using ground truth labels. So in this case, you perform unsupervised fine-tuning using data relevant to the task. What they do is they take this ChatGPT comparison data and they ignore the human preferences. 
what they're left with is just prefix completion pairs. But then you might say that because they reused their ChatGPT comparison data, instead of a new supervision data set, they're kind of cheating because even if they don't use the human preferences, they're still reusing some part of the data. But actually, they compared the performance to a strong ceiling models. And by strong ceiling, they mean that they also first generatively fine-tune the strong ceiling. So the GPT-4 was first fine-tuned with ChatGPT comparison data without the human preferences, and then did the same like fine-tuning on the, on the normal data set with the human preferences. So even by comparing to this strong ceiling, they still improved the performance gap recovered by 10 to 20%. So they ended up with three different techniques that help with weak to strong generalization. But none of these methods work for every situation. And there are two problems that might arise when humans will try to align superhuman models, which they call disanalogies in this paper. The first disanalogy is imitation saliency, where superhuman models may easily imitate weak errors from their human supervisors, but might have a harder time imitating weak errors from AI supervisors, because human errors are all over the pretending data of current language models. On the contrary, in the paper they mention other results that suggest that pre-training models may have a hard time fitting errors of other small pre-trained models. And there's also the observation in the context of knowledge utilization, where it's also surprisingly hard for models to fit the predictions of other models, even if they have sufficient capacity to do so. All of this evidence leads us to believe that superhuman models might have an easier time imitating weak errors from humans in the context of human supervisors and superhuman human models. The second problem is what they call pre-training leakage, where superhuman knowledge may be latent and not observable. In this paper, they were able to elicit knowledge from strong models by using standard NLP tasks like the PsyQ NLP task, which plausibly are already in part of the pre-training data, but framed differently, which overall makes the weak to strong generalization a bit easier for these strong models. But in the future, we might have models that are being trained using mostly reinforcement learning or self-supervised learning. But hey, as far as I know, we don't have any superhuman AI just yet. So if you want to make sure the first one is aligned, you can support my channel by direct human feedback in the comments, or give me some human reinforcements by joining the Patreon page, link in the description.